In the depths of ancient Buddhist scriptures lies a profound story of sacrifice, wisdom, and transformation. It is the tale of Bodhisattva Medicine King, whose former deeds shine like a beacon, guiding seekers through the mists of delusion toward the light of truth. This chapter delves into the rich symbolism and teachings surrounding this revered figure, unraveling the profound meanings hidden within the Lotus Sutra's elegant prose. Let us begin our journey with a simple yet powerful image, the fragrant rain of sandalwood. The sutra paints this vivid picture, stating, He rained also incense of the sandalwood that grows by the southern seashore. At first glance, one might see only a pleasant aroma wafting through the air. But for those who peer deeper, a world of meaning unfolds. Seemingly about mere scent and color, actually speaks to the heart of Buddhist practice. It teaches us that even the most mundane aspects of our world fragrances and hues embody the middle way. By recognizing this truth and meditating upon it, we make offerings to the Buddha with what is called the true law. What is this true law? It is none other than Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, the vehicle of the Lotus Sutra itself. This phrase, often chanted by both lay believers and priests, represents the one pure truth that permeates all existence. When we chant these words, we become living embodiments of this ultimate reality. But the story of the Medicine King does not stop at fragrant offerings. It takes a dramatic turn, challenging our understanding of devotion and wisdom. The Sutra recounts a startling act. Calling on his transcendental powers, he set fire to his body. This self-immolation, far from being a mere spectacle, carries deep spiritual significance. Nichiren Daishonin, the revered Buddhist teacher, offers insight into this fiery symbolism. He explains that when the Lotus Sutra speaks of the medicine king burning his body and arms, it points to a profound inner transformation. Fire, in its essence, brings light. Therefore, to burn is to illuminate, and illumination is the hallmark of wisdom. What then does this wisdom burn? It consumes the body of earthly desires and the arms of birth and death. In other words, the fire of true understanding incinerates our attachments and breaks the chains of samsara, the endless cycle of rebirth. This interpretation challenges us to look beyond literal meanings. The physical act of burning becomes a metaphor for an internal, spiritual process. It invites us to kindle our own inner fire not to harm ourselves, but to shed light on the darkest corners of our minds. As we contemplate these teachings, we might wonder about their practical application. How do they relate to the suffering we encounter in daily life? The Lotus Sutra addresses this directly, declaring, it can cause all living beings to cast off all distress, all sickness and pain. It can unloose the bonds of birth and death. At first glance, phrases like, cast off, and unloose, might seem at odds with the sutra's central message that worldly passions are precisely enlightenment, and birth and death are none other than nirvana. However, Nichiren offers a nuanced interpretation that resolves this apparent contradiction. He suggests that, casting off, should be understood as, becoming enlightened concerning. When we open the eyes of wisdom, particularly the wisdom of the, Juryo, chapter of the Lotus Sutra's essential teaching, we see our afflictions in a new light. Sickness, pain, suffering, and trouble are illuminated as inherent aspects of existence, not external impositions. This realization is the Buddha's own wisdom, received for his enjoyment. Similarly, unloosing takes on a deeper meaning. Our birth and death are not recent phenomena but have always been inherent in our being. Recognizing this truth loosens the fetters of believing that enlightenment is something to be acquired externally. Instead, we awaken to the enlightenment that has always been present within us. In this context, the seemingly simple words, cast off, and unloose, become potent representations of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. They encapsulate the process of awakening to our true nature, which has never been separate from the ultimate reality of the universe. The Sutra goes on to extol the benefits of this awakening. The good fortune you gain thereby is immeasurable and boundless. It cannot be burned by fire or washed away by water. 
These elements, fire and water, are not just physical forces but symbols of the most extreme sufferings. Fire represents the searing flames of the hell of incessant suffering, while water signifies the bitter chill of the hell of unspeakable cold. Yet the good fortune born of true understanding remains untouched by even these torments. This teaches us that genuine wisdom transcends all dualities, remaining steadfast in the face of any adversity. This immeasurable good fortune and boundless wisdom are not distant ideals but the very fabric of our reality. The physical and spiritual aspects of the universe known as Eho and Shoho are already endowed with these qualities. Nam Myoho Renge Kyo embodies both, serving as a bridge between the manifest and the unseen. As our exploration nears its conclusion, we encounter perhaps the most hopeful message of all. The Sutra proclaims, this sutra provides good medicine for the ills of the people of Jambudvipa. If a person who has an illness is able to hear this sutra, then his illness will be wiped out and he will know neither old age or death. These words resonate with promise, but their true depth might elude casual reading. Nichiren illuminates their meaning, explaining that to know neither old age refers to happiness specifically, the four virtues of eternity, happiness, true self, and purity. Meanwhile, the absence of death points to eternal life. But what does it mean to truly hear the sutra? It goes beyond mere listening to sounds or reading words on a page. To hear in the deepest sense is to internalize its teachings, to let them permeate every fiber of one's being. When we achieve this level of understanding, we touch the core of existence itself, a realm where the conventional notions of aging and death lose their sting. This state is not a negation of our lived experience but a profound shift in perspective. Old age becomes not a decline but an accumulation of wisdom. Death transforms from an ending into a transition within the greater continuity of life. In embracing the Lotus Sutra's teachings, we attain what Nichiren calls eternal happiness, a condition that transcends the fleeting pleasures and sorrows of ordinary existence. The legacy of Bodhisattva Medicine King, then, is far more than a collection of ancient stories. It is a living tradition, a path that leads from the sandalwood-scented shores of initial practice to the blazing peaks of self-realization. It challenges us to see beyond appearances, to recognize the profound in the simple, and to awaken the Buddha nature that has always resided within us. As we close this chapter, let us reflect on the journey we've undertaken. We've traversed landscapes of metaphor and meaning, guided by the wisdom of sages. The fragrant rain, the burning body, the good fortune impervious to extremes all these images converge into a singular truth, that enlightenment is not distant but immediate, not foreign but intimately our own. In the spirit of the medicine king, may we too become beacons of wisdom, illuminating the way for others. And may we always remember that in the melody of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, we carry the medicine that cures the fundamental illness of ignorance, leading us to the shores of boundless light. The eternal practice, embodying the medicine king's teachings. As we continue our exploration of the Bodhisattva medicine king's legacy, we delve deeper into the practical application of his teachings in our daily lives. The profound acts of the Medicine King are not merely historical events to be admired from afar, but living examples that call us to action. How, then, can we embody these teachings in the modern world? The Sutra's description of the Medicine King's offerings provides a starting point. The fragrant rain of sandalwood incense represents more than just a pleasant aroma. It symbolizes the pervasive nature of the true law. Just as the scent permeates the air, touching all without discrimination, so too does the essence of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo pervade every aspect of our existence. This understanding transforms our perception of daily life. Each action, no matter how mundane, becomes an opportunity for practice. Preparing a meal, tending to a garden, or even cleaning one's living space can be imbued with the spirit of offering. The key lies in our mindset recognizing that these activities are not separate from our Buddhist practice but are, in fact, direct expressions of it. Nichiren Daishonin emphasizes this point, stating, when we revere Myoho Renge Kyo inherent in our own life as the object of devotion, 
the Buddha wisdom is within us, and we, too, can readily become Buddhas. This passage reminds us that the object of devotion is not external to us. It is the mystic law, Myoho Renge Kyo, within our own lives. Our daily activities, when performed with this awareness, become acts of reverence. But what of the more challenging aspects of the Medicine King's story, the burning of his own body? Surely, we are not called to literal self-immolation. Instead, this dramatic act invites us to consider what we're willing to burn or let go of in our spiritual journey. The fire that consumes the Medicine King's physical form represents the wisdom that consumes our delusions. In practical terms, this might mean critically examining our long-held beliefs and habits. What attachments keep us bound to suffering? What desires fuel the cycle of birth and death? These are the bodies we are called to set aflame. This process is not always comfortable. Just as fire causes pain when it touches the skin, the light of wisdom can be searing when it illuminates our shortcomings. But this discomfort is transformative. As Nichiren teaches, burning one's body is a metaphor for burning the firewood of earthly desires. When we confront our own greed, anger, and ignorance with unflinching honesty, we initiate a profound purification. The sutras promise that this practice leads to immeasurable good fortune takes on new meaning in this context. This fortune is not material wealth or worldly success, but rather a state of being that remains unshaken by external circumstances. It is a joy that can never be destroyed, as one commentary puts it. How do we cultivate such joy? The answer lies in the heart of the Lotus Sutra's teachings, the recognition that worldly passions are precisely enlightenment and that birth and death are precisely nirvana. This is not mere philosophical rhetoric but a practical guideline for living. When faced with challenges be they physical illness, emotional turmoil, or social conflict we're often tempted to see them as obstacles to our happiness, things to be cast off or escaped. But the deeper teaching invites us to a radical shift in perspective. Instead of rejecting these experiences, we're called to illuminate them with the light of wisdom. This illumination reveals that our struggles are not separate from the path to enlightenment. They are the very stuff of which that path is made. Our task is not to eliminate suffering but to transform our relationship to it. As we chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, we're not seeking to change our external circumstances as much as we're working to awaken to the inherent dignity and limitless potential within our current situation. The Medicine King's legacy challenges us to see that every moment whether filled with joy or sorrow is an opportunity to manifest our Buddha nature. The illness that seems to limit us becomes a teacher of patience and compassion. The conflict that disturbs our peace becomes a crucible for forging unshakable conviction. In this light, the sutra's description of itself as good medicine takes on profound significance. Just as medicine doesn't always taste pleasant but works to heal nonetheless, the teachings may sometimes seem bitter to our worldly preferences. They ask us to confront what we'd rather ignore, to embrace what we'd usually push away. But in doing so, they cure the fundamental malady of ignorance. To know neither old age nor death is to live in the awareness that our true self is not bound by physical decline or the end of bodily functions. It is to touch the eternal present, where each moment is complete in itself, needing nothing from past or future to justify its worth. This eternal present is where true creativity flourishes. The Medicine King's offerings were not rote rituals but spontaneous expressions of devotion. Similarly, our practice calls us to respond creatively to life's challenges, always seeking new ways to manifest wisdom and compassion. As we conclude this exploration, let us remember that the chapter on the former deeds of Bodhisattva Medicine King is not just a story from the past, it is a mirror reflecting our own infinite potential. It beckons us to make offerings of our entire being body, speech, and mind to the great project of human revolution. In the fragrant rain of our sincere practice, in the illuminating fire of our determined introspection, and in the good medicine of our unwavering faith, we carry forward the torch lit by the Medicine King. And in so doing, we light the way not only for ourselves but for all those around us, 
fulfilling the Bodhisattva's vow to heal the world. Let us, then, step boldly into each day, ready to transform every trial into a tribute, every hardship into an offering. For in the boundless realm of Nang Myoho Renge Kyo, there is no experience that cannot be medicine, no moment that is not sacred, and no life that is not a profound expression of the Buddha's enlightenment. The Living Sutra, Manifesting the Medicine King in Our Lives As we deepen our understanding of the Bodhisattva Medicine King's legacy, we come to a pivotal realization. The true purpose of studying his deeds is not simply to admire them from afar, but to manifest them in our own lives. We are called to become living sutras, embodying the teachings in every aspect of our existence. But what does this mean in practical terms, and how can we navigate the complexities of modern life while staying true to these ancient teachings? Let us begin by revisiting the concept of offering. The Medicine King's offerings were not limited to material objects, they encompassed his entire being. This total dedication is beautifully captured in the imagery of his body becoming a torch of Dharma. While we may not literally set ourselves ablaze, we are invited to consider, what would it mean to offer our whole selves to the promotion of the mystic law? Nichiren Daishonin provides guidance on this point, stating, both practice and study arise from faith. Teaching others is a practice that arises from faith. The effort to learn and to solve doubts is also a practice that arises from faith. This passage illuminates a crucial aspect of our modern practice, the integration of faith, study, and teaching. In our daily lives, this might manifest as an unwavering commitment to our own Buddhist practice coupled with a genuine effort to deepen our understanding of the teachings. It's not enough to simply recite the words of the sutra. We must strive to grasp their meaning and apply them to our circumstances. This ongoing process of study becomes a form of offering, much like the fragrant sandalwood incense that permeated the air around the medicine king. The act of teaching others sharing our insights, experiences, and understanding of the mystic law becomes a powerful expression of faith. When we engage in dialogue about the teachings, patiently addressing doubts, our own and others, and striving to ignite the flame of faith in those around us, we are, in a very real sense, continuing the Medicine King's work. But what of the sutra's more enigmatic passages? Consider again the statement, it can cause all living beings to cast off all distress, all sickness and pain. It can unloose the bonds of birth and death. How do we translate this into lived experience? The key lies in understanding that casting off does not mean escaping or avoiding our problems. Rather, it points to a fundamental shift in our relationship to suffering. When we deeply internalize the teaching that our Buddha nature is ever present, even amidst challenges, we begin to see our struggles not as mere obstacles but as opportunities for awakening. In this light, physical illness becomes a teacher of impermanence and interconnectedness. Emotional pain transforms into a catalyst for developing compassion. Even the specter of death loses its sting as we awaken to the rhythms of a larger, cosmic life that knows no beginning or end. This is not to diminish the reality of suffering. The fire still burns, the illness still weakens, the loss still aches. But armed with the wisdom of the Lotus Sutra, we face these trials differently. We recognize, as Nichiren teaches, that earthly desires are enlightenment, and the sufferings of birth and death are nirvana. Our problems, rather than pulling us away from Buddhahood, become the very soil from which our enlightenment blooms. Practically speaking, this might mean approaching our daily challenges be they in our careers, relationships, or personal health with a spirit of curiosity and engagement rather than mere endurance or resignation. We ask ourselves, what can this situation teach me? How can I use this experience to deepen my faith and practice? The Medicine King's burning of his arms for 72,000 years symbolizes this sustained, wholehearted engagement with life's trials. It reminds us that the path to enlightenment is not a sprint but a marathon, requiring patience, persistence, and unwavering dedication. In our modern context, where instant gratification is often prized, this long-term perspective is revolutionary. 
it invites us to measure our progress not by immediate results but by the gradual yet profound changes in our character and understanding. Are we becoming more compassionate? More resilient? More aware of the interconnectedness of all life? These are the true markers of our practice's efficacy. The sutra's assurance that the benefits of such practice cannot be burned by fire or washed away by water speaks to the indestructible nature of the good fortune we accrue. This is not mere poetic hyperbole but a testament to the fact that genuine spiritual growth transcends material circumstances. When we base our happiness on external conditions, wealth, status, even physical health, we remain vulnerable to life's inevitable fluctuations. But when our joy is rooted in the immovable ground of our Buddha nature, expressed through our faith in and practice of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, we cultivate a well being that no adversity can diminish. This brings us to perhaps the most profound aspect of the Medicine King's legacy his role as a healer. The sutra's description of itself as good medicine for all ills is not just a metaphor. It points to the transformative power of the teachings when fully embraced and embodied. In a world often fragmented by division and discord, our practice of the mystic law becomes a healing force. By refusing to be defined by our differences and instead focusing on the shared Buddha nature that unites all living beings, we contribute to the spiritual and social health of our communities. This healing is not always dramatic or immediately visible. Like the gradual effects of a powerful medicine, it often works subtly, from the inside out. We might notice it in small ways at first a decrease in our reactivity, an increase in our capacity for empathy, a growing ability to find meaning even in difficult circumstances. But over time, these small changes ripple outward. Our families, workplaces, and wider social circles begin to feel the impact of our transformed perspective. We become living proof that happiness is not dictated by external conditions but wells up from within when we tap into the inexhaustible reservoir of our Buddha nature. As we conclude this exploration, let us remember that the ultimate goal of studying the Medicine King's deeds is not to replicate them exactly but to capture their spirit in ways relevant to our own time and place. Our offerings may not be rare in senses or our own physical bodies, but they can be our time, our energy, our compassion, and our unwavering commitment to spreading the mystic law. In every act of patience with a difficult colleague, in every moment spent listening to a troubled friend, in every effort to create value in our work and in our communities, we are making offerings as precious as any described in the ancient texts. We are becoming, each in our own unique way, medicine kings and queens for our era. Let us therefore go forth with renewed determination, confident that as we strive to embody these teachings, we are contributing to the fulfillment of the great vow made by all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to relieve suffering and open the way to enlightenment for all living beings. In this endeavor, every day becomes an opportunity for profound offering, every challenge an invitation to deepen our practice, and every encounter a chance to administer the good medicine of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo to a world in need of healing.